We've already spoken a little about the great man model of history when telling the story of Pachacuti's remarkable conquest of the Andes. The great man theory was an idea that gained currency in the 19th century and argued that history was a product of the impacts of great men, unique individuals who were highly influential due to their natural abilities, their heroic courage, or their superior intellects. This is a model that, for good reason, has fallen out of favor among historians. But it can still be hard to explain certain moments in history where events really did seem to turn on the determination and sometimes the obsession of a single person. In this story, that person will be a Spaniard by the name of Francisco Pizarro. Pizarro was born in the Extremadura region of southeastern Spain, a region whose name comes from the Latin phrase extrema et dura, that is, remote and hard. And it gives you a pretty good idea of what life was like here through most of its history. The land was dry and tough in the summer, and the people here were often poor. Pizarro was born in the most humble conditions imaginable. There are no official documents recording his birth, suggesting that he may have been an illegitimate child, perhaps abandoned and taken in by his adoptive family of peasant farmers. His adopted mother worked as a servant, while his father was a soldier who had earned himself the nickname the Roman for his exploits fighting in Italy. Pizarro had no education and began his life herding pigs in the town of Trujillo. As a teenager, he joined the army, wanting to follow in his father's footsteps. And he was immediately swept up in the campaign known as the Reconquista, or the Reconquest. This saw the Muslim kingdoms of southern Spain conquered by Spanish armies and brought under the rule of a Spanish monarch. We don't know exactly where Pizarro fought on this campaign, but it's likely that he saw some of these famous battles and may have even participated in the capture of the final Muslim capital of Granada. The mythology of the Reconquista has a prominent place in the imaginations of Spanish people around this time, and the Spanish would carry it with them into the New World. In fact, whenever Pizarro and his men encountered the temples of the Inca and other peoples, they would refer to them in their writing as mosques. When the dust from the War of Reconquista settled and the financial opportunities for mercenaries began to dry up in Spain, Pizarro made the decision to cross over to the New World. In the year 1502, he sailed to Hispaniola, the island that had become the first European foothold in the Americas. There, he became a member of the governor's bodyguard and earned a reputation as a woodsman and a fierce fighter of native people. Pizarro had a character that was well suited to the brutal world of the Spanish colonies. He earned a considerable fortune as a slaver, a plantation owner and a trader. In the New World, Pizarro achieved a level of wealth and status that would have been impossible in Spain, where the entrenched class system meant he would always be treated as a peasant. The New World suited him. He seems to have fostered no desire to ever return to his homeland, and instead spent his days surrounded by slave women and all the trappings of wealth in the New World. But it's clear there was also something of an itch in him, that his life there couldn't quite scratch. It seems he wanted not just to be wealthy and comfortable, but to be respected, even feared. He wanted an achievement that he could throw in the faces of all those nobles back home who once would have looked down on him from such a height. But all of Pizarro's early attempts at adventuring would meet 
with disastrous failure. He set off on a number of different expeditions into the New World, among them one led by the Spaniard Alonso de Ojeda, who set up a colony in what is today Colombia and Venezuela. Pizarro was paid no wage for the expedition, instead being promised a percentage of the total treasure that the expedition brought back. But Ojeda's expedition was poorly managed. The colony of San Sebastian that they founded was built in a low-lying swampy region, beset with mosquitoes and disease. These were the same conditions that had caused the Inca armies of the Emperor Huayna Capac such difficulties. The indigenous people here regularly shot at the Spanish with arrows dipped in poison, and the colony offered no wealth, no gold or silver, and barely supported the meager existence of its colonists. San Sebastian was eventually abandoned, and Pizarro soon discovered that it's not much use having a percentage of the expedition's earnings if its earnings are roughly zero. Disconsolate but not discouraged, he soon departed for Colombia, and from there joined the explorer Vasco Núñez de Balboa and sailed to modern-day Panama. Although the Spanish didn't know it yet, this was the thinnest point of the American continent. Here, the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans are only 50 kilometers apart, and it's at this crossing point between the oceans that the destiny of Pizarro and the fate of the Inca would be sealed. Balboa and Pizarro set about the settlement of Panama with the usual destruction and enslavement that accompanied all European settlement in the New World. There they set up the colony of Tierra Firme, but still no one knew how much land existed behind the long coast of the Americas. It's recorded that one local chief called Comogre seems to have decided to cooperate with them and offered to pay them off in both gold and information. It's here that the Spaniards first heard of the existence of another ocean to the west. As one Spanish conquistador, Pascal de Andagoya, recalls in this letter to the Spanish king. They say that the people of the other coast are very good and well-mannered. And I am told that the other sea is very good for canoe navigation, for that it is always smooth and never rough like the sea on this side according to the Indians. I believe that there are many islands in that sea. They say that there are many large pearls, and that the chiefs have baskets of them. In one version of the story, the chief Camogre's son is said to have burst out in a rage when the Spanish kept demanding gold from his father and let out this fuming proclamation. If you are so hungry for gold that you leave your lands to cause strife in those of others, I shall show you a province where you can quell this hunger. The idea of a mythical city of gold lying just beyond the horizon was a common theme of the Spanish settlement of the Americas. The king of this place became known as El Hombre Dorado or El Rey Dorado, the golden man or king. This was a mythical character who was supposed to bathe himself in gold dust. And over time, the legends became more outlandish, until El Dorado went from being a man to a whole city, then a kingdom, and finally an entire empire of gold. And it's not hard to see how this piece of folklore would have emerged. Whenever native people discovered the European obsession with the precious metal gold, they would often assure them that there was plenty of gold just over the next hill, if only they would pack up and leave them in peace. Whether Comogre and his son really knew about the Inca 
and the gold that decorated their temples high in the Andes, or whether they were just trying to get the Spanish to move on, we can never know. But the result was the same. Balboa organized an expedition to cross the Isthmus of Panama and reach what he called the Other Sea. Pizarro was a captain of this expedition. Hacking their way through the dense jungle of the interior of Panama, thick with mangroves, vines, and strangler figs, the conquistadors nearly cooked in their armor. They were plagued by mosquitoes and disease, but finally they cut through the last bit of jungle and saw a vast body of water stretching out, boundless and blue into the horizon. The life of a conquistador in the New World was violent and ruthless. They lived largely beyond the reach of the law, and often the greatest dangers came from the other conquistadors around them. Pizarro had been Balboa's friend for many years, but when the opportunity came to betray him, he didn't hesitate. In one of the routine power struggles that took place here at the edge of the world, Pizarro was ordered to arrest Balboa. The man was later executed. For his services in this coup, Pizarro was given a swampy bit of land to call his own, and he settled down to the life of a colonial baron. He retired from soldiering, and perhaps this is where he might have stayed. That is, if it wasn't for the news that would soon come trickling down the coast from Mexico about the incredible exploits of one of his distant cousins, a man named Hernán Cortés, who had taken 600 men and with them toppled an empire. For many historians, the comparisons between Francisco Pizarro and Hernán Cortés are obvious. As we saw in episode 9, Cortés had led a tiny army and with them captured the Aztec king Moctezuma, toppling the greatest indigenous empire of Mexico. Cortés was now considered a hero in the Spanish court and his exploits were legendary. Pizarro was a second cousin of Cortés and seven years older than him and he openly admired his overachieving relation. They were both from that same hard region of Extremadura in Spain and had both set sail to explore the New World, living in Hispaniola at the same time. But there are also some significant differences in these characters, as the historian W. H. Prescott recounts. Pizarro seems to have had the example of his great predecessor before his eyes on more than one occasion but he fell far short of his model, for his coarser nature and more ferocious temper often betrayed him into acts most repugnant to sound policy, which would never have been countenanced by the conqueror of Mexico. Cortés was a member of the noble Hidalgo class. He had a legal education and worked as a notary and treasurer. The letters he wrote to King Charles V are one of the great sources of information about the conquest of Mexico. And while we may not always trust his account of events, he does speak to us out of history with a commanding voice, explaining his motivations, his desires and his fears. But Pizarro is more of an enigma. In fact, he was illiterate and could neither read nor write. All we learn about his motivations comes from those who accompanied him and wrote down their accounts. By the year 1521, the great Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan had been conquered by the Spanish and reduced to a smoking ruin. All of Spain and its colonies were buzzing with this news, and the fame and wealth that Cortés won in this expedition seems to have reignited Pizarro's lust for adventure. By this time, he was in middle age. From depictions of him at the time, we can see he was a man with a thick beard and a flat face with wide spreading cheekbones and a lantern jaw. 
His cousin Pedro Pizarro described him in the following way. He was a very Christian man, and very zealous in the service of his majesty. He was tall and spare, having a good face and a thin beard. And personally, he was valiant and vigorous, a truthful man. It was his custom, whenever anyone asked him for anything, always to say no. He said this in order that he might not fail to keep his word. And though he said no, he always did in the end what was asked of him, if there were not reason against it. In 1522, just one year after he heard news of Cortez's exploits, Pizarro returned to adventuring. He joined a company heading south along Panama's Pacific coast, determined to find out the truth about the rumored cities of gold that were supposed to lie to the south, in a land that had attained a semi-mythical status for them, and which was called Biru. While Cortez's expedition had been a relatively amateur affair, with very few professional soldiers, Pizarro's men were even more of a rough bunch. He had about a hundred men with him, many of whom signed up to escape debts or to avoid being put in jail for various crimes. These were stragglers and ruffians rather than soldiers. They had enough money for only two ships, and they set sail in November 1524. It was the worst possible season for sea travel, and Pizarro's usual bad luck prevailed. Rain and storms hammered their ships, and they quickly ran out of supplies. The men ate raw crabs and shellfish, as well as berries from the shore, which turned out to be poisonous and made them severely ill. Pizarro's expedition crept along the Pacific coast of South America for more than a year, experiencing misfortune after misfortune with one of their ships making regular supply runs back to Panama. But eventually, in the year 1526, they came across something they had never seen before in the Americas. It was a native boat with a sail. When they stopped the craft, they found that the boat was a raft carrying 20 indigenous people, as well as a great variety of jewelry and cloth and other decorative items like belts, necklaces, and pins made of gold and silver, and inlaid with gems. Their clothes were finely embroidered, decorated with patterns of birds, flowers, and animals. The Spanish asked where these goods had come from, and the people gave the answer they had been waiting for. They said it had all come from a wealthy land that lay to the south, a land called Peru. The news lit a fire under Pizarro, but his men were sick and tired of the expedition. Their misfortunes continued, and soon news returned to them that the governor of Panama had ordered their return. When his men heard the news, they were overjoyed, as Cieza de Leon recalls. Pizarro was downcast when he saw they all wanted to go. He quietly composed himself, and said that, of course, they could return to Panama, and the choice was theirs. He had not wanted them to leave, because they would have their reward if and when they discovered a good land. As for himself, he felt that returning poor to Panama was a harder thing than staying to face death and hardship. Pizarro shared something of Cortez's passion for dramatics and one instance has passed into legend and idiom. He took his sword and drew a line in the sand and gave his men the following announcement. Friends and comrades, on that side are toil, hunger, nakedness, the drenching storm, desertion and death. On this side, ease and pleasure. There lies Peru, with all its riches. Here, Panama and its poverty. Choose, each man, what best becomes a brave Spaniard. For my part, I go south. Most of Pizarro's men were not won over by this piece of oratory. Only 13 men stepped over the line. 
but it was enough for his journey to continue. In the year 1528, Pizarro reached the Incan town of Tumbez, today located on the border between Ecuador and Peru. And here, finally, was evidence of the wealthy empire he had been promised. Tumbez was a magnificent port city. The old Inca king Tupac Yapanqui had built a strong fortress there, along with a fine temple staffed with 500 virgins who served the sun god. The town was well supplied with water from several aqueducts, and the historian W.H. Prescott recalls the reaction of the Spanish to this site. The Spaniards were nearly mad with joy at receiving these brilliant tidings of the Peruvian city. All their fond dreams were now to be realized, and they had at length reached the realm, which had so long fitted in visionary splendor before them. The people of Tumbez received Pizarro and his men politely and graciously. They even gave Pizarro two boys, who he took with him back to Panama and taught to speak Spanish. He would use them as translators throughout the following years, and all of this was very convenient for Pizarro and played directly into his plans, as the chronicler Naaro recalls. It was manifestly the work of heaven that the natives of the country should have received him in so kind and loving a spirit as best fitted to facilitate the conquest. Encouraged and reeling from the magnitude of his discovery, Pizarro sailed further up the coast, and everywhere he saw small towns and coastal hamlets. Everywhere he went, the people told him that they were part of a great empire, whose capital lay far up in the high mountains. They told him stories of the glittering city of gold, where the great emperor Atahualpa ruled. They saw the enormous networks of aqueducts that made even the coastal deserts bloom, and the well-maintained roads linking the settlements. Pizarro now felt that he had evidence enough to confirm the rumors, but his tiny force had no hope of making anything of his discovery. He returned to Panama and began to prepare for another final voyage. The arrival of the Spanish at Tumbez caused a ripple of consternation in the Inca lands. The entire region was wracked by the destruction of the civil war that had followed the death of the Emperor Huayna Capac, along with the spreading plague that had brought such desolation. The Waro Chiri manuscript recalls the opportunistic struggle of this time with a note of disdain. After Huayna Capac had died, people scrambled for political power, each saying to their others, Me first! Me first! It was while they were carrying on this way that the Spanish appeared. The Inca ruler and chronicler named Taitu Kusi, who had been a boy at the time of the invasion, recounted his memories of that time in a remarkable document almost 30 years later. In it, he recalls the shock and confusion that the arrival of the Spanish caused as messengers burst into his father's palace with the news. They reported having observed that certain people had arrived in their land, people who were very different from us in custom and dress. When my father heard this, he was beside himself and said, how dare those people intrude into my country without my authorization and permission? Who are these people and what are their ways? The messengers answered, They claim to have come by the wind. They are bearded people, very beautiful and white. They eat out of silver plates. Even their sheep, who carry them, are large and wear silver shoes. They throw thunder like the sky. Taitu Kusi even captures what it was like to see the Spaniards reading for the first time. We have witnessed with our own eyes that they talk to white cloths by themselves, and that they call some of us by our names, without having been informed by anyone, 
and only looking into the sheets, which they hold in front of them. Another later chronicler, Father Banabe Kobo, recounts similar scenes of fear and confusion. The messengers, who were much alarmed and frightened, as by something that they had never dreamed of, told the Inca how some strange people, never seen before, had landed on the beach. These men were stuffed into their clothes, which covered them from head to foot. They were white and had beards and a ferocious appearance. And when the Inca asked from what part of the world they had come, he was told that the messengers only knew that the strangers travelled across the sea in large wooden houses. As in the conquest of Mexico, Inca sources recall the appearance of signs and portents before the arrival of the Spanish. An eagle had been seen being attacked by condors above the main square of Cusco. Comets were sighted across the Andes, and many had reported seeing a blood-red circle enveloping the moon. But no one knew what the arrival of these foreigners could mean. In Panama, Pizarro finally sailed back into port to the astonishment of many of the people there. It had been more than 18 months since they'd last been heard from, and most had assumed that he and his meagre crew had been lost at sea. But news of his discovery didn't create the explosion of interest that he had hoped. In fact, the governor of Panama refused him permission to go on any more expeditions. Pizarro was frustrated. The temptation of that faraway empire, along with all its gold and glory, began to possess him. We can imagine him lying awake at night in the hot Panama air, listening to the whining of mosquitoes overhead and the cackling of spider monkeys in the trees outside his cabin, all the while thinking about the glory that might await him far away on the shores of the other sea. In 1528, he decided to take a drastic course of action. He would make his way back to Spain with the intention of gaining an audience with the king and queen, who ruled from their opulent court in Toledo. The journey across the Atlantic could take six weeks if the weather was good and as long as two to three months if it wasn't. Since he had last been to Spain, Pizarro must have found it a much changed place. He had known it as a wealthy medieval state, but in the last three decades, it had become the bustling hub of a colonial empire. Its ports had swollen with the vast wealth coming in on its treasure ships, and now enormous thousand-ton galleons, carrying hundreds of cannons, would have towered over the roofs of its houses. To this rough peasant farmer, used to life on the frontiers, the exquisite finery of the royal court must have been staggering. It would have been an incredible moment for this poor swineherd, approaching the royal couple surrounded by their finery, and given a hero's welcome. The conqueror of Mexico, Hernán Cortés, was at that time resident in the Spanish court, and his presence may have gone some way to sway the royal couple into meeting this man. Pizarro presented the king and queen with gold and jewels, exotic birds and embroidered cloth, even the fleece of a llama, along with a newly drawn map of Peru. The royal couple must have looked at these treasures hungrily. The capture of Mexico only eight years before had swollen the royal treasury, and now this commoner was offering to conquer yet another indigenous empire and bring back even more treasure. In 1529, on July the 26th, the Queen of Spain signed a charter authorizing the invasion of Peru which they had already decided to rename. 
Without the Inca having the slightest knowledge of it, their land had been renamed New Castile, with the stroke of a pen 10,000 kilometers away. Because you are Captain Francisco Pizarro, a resident of Tierra Ferme, called Castilla del Oro, you have taken the charge of going to conquer, discover, pacify and populate the coast of the South Sea of said land, to the eastern part. The Queen also made Pizarro a Knight of the Order of Santiago, Spain's highest order of knighthood, established in the Middle Ages to protect pilgrims. He was effectively being appointed a crusader, and the crown gave Pizarro several Dominican monks to take with him to underscore that he was on a religious mission. They gave him a license to buy artillery in Panama, as well as 25 horses from Jamaica and 30 African slaves from Cuba, their foreheads branded with the letter R showing that they were royal possessions. But other than this, the monarchy offered no direct support, instead promising as usual that the men could keep a share of any loot that their campaign acquired. For them, Pizarro's expedition was low risk and potentially very high reward. By January 1530, Pizarro had returned to Panama and prepared his expedition. He brought with him his 15-year-old cousin Pedro as an assistant, who would later write one of the most important eyewitness accounts of the invasion. But Pizarro had his usual run of bad luck on the voyage. Strong headwinds blowing up the Pacific coast stopped his progress for nearly two weeks, and storms ravaged their ships. But finally, he arrived back at the port town of Tumbes. What he found there astonished him. The formerly booming town was now completely abandoned. Francisco Jerez recalls the eerie sight that the Spanish found. The town of Tumbes was destroyed. It seemed to have been an important place, judging from some edifices it contained. It had open courts and rooms, and doors for defense, and was a good fortress against Indians. The natives say that these edifices were abandoned by reason of a great pestilence, and by reason of a war. Only four or five of the largest houses and the walls of the fortress remained standing, and these were greatly damaged and looted of all their finery. When the Spanish landed, they managed to find some locals hiding nearby, who told them that in the civil war raging over the empire, Tumbes had been loyal to King Huascar in Cusco, and armies loyal to Atahualpa had punished them by destroying the town. Pizarro was distraught. He'd spent much of the tough voyage encouraging his men with stories of the rich town of Tumbes and now it was nothing but a pile of rubble. He must have known that his position was precarious and that his soldiers wouldn't remain loyal long if he couldn't show them results. He knew that the capital of a great empire lay somewhere up in the mountains, and after some time recuperating in the ruins of Tumbes, he resolved to march up into the hills and find it. Pizarro set out on the 16th of May, 1532, with a company of 187 men, made up of 62 cavalry and 102 foot soldiers, three artillery operators with cannons, and 20 men with crossbows. Ahead of them lay a journey of more than 2,000 kilometers, across harsh, arid deserts and snow-capped mountains but the events that would lead to the final fall of the Inca Empire had now truly begun. It's not clear why Atahualpa allowed Pizarro to found his settlement on the coast, 
or to march unhindered into the mountains. In the centuries since the conquest, many have proposed their theories. Some chroniclers at the time claimed that the Inca believed the Spanish to be gods. Some indigenous chronicles, like that of Taitu Kusi, repeated this idea, although his account is full of flattery for the Spanish, and perhaps he can't entirely be trusted on this point. As we've seen in the conquest of Mexico and the Aztec Empire, there's really little first-hand evidence that indigenous people considered Europeans to be divine. And if this was their initial impression, it's one that they quickly dispensed with, as Cieza de Leon recalls. As the Spaniards were so free from all restraint, and held the honor of the people so lightly, in return for the hospitality and friendliness with which they were received, the Indians saw how little reverence the Spaniards felt for the sun, and how shamelessly and without the fear of God they violated the women, began to say that such people were not sons of God, but that they were worse than supais, which is their name for devil. The most likely answer is that Atahualpa was simply too busy to deal with the Spanish. He was engaged in a full-scale war for the survival of his kingdom, against his brother Huascar in the central Andes. The chronicler Juan de Betanzos, who interviewed his Inca in-laws in the 1550s about their memories of those days, records that the news about Pizarro's landing reached Atahualpa at exactly the moment that he heard of his brother's surrender and capture, a moment of victory that must have occupied all his thoughts. When Pizarro began his march up into the hills, Atahualpa was just then in the middle of a march of his own, a triumphal procession back to Cusco with his army, to destroy the last remaining noble families loyal to his brother Huascar, to strip Cusco of its wealth and drag all its gold back to his home of Quito, where he would declare himself the Emperor of the Inca. The arrival of this small group of foreigners was certainly a curiosity for him, but there's no indication he considered them a threat, or even considered them much at all. They were very few in number, they weren't outwardly aggressive, and his only concern must have been to prevent them from intervening in the final stages of this civil war. Taitu Kusi even records that Atahualpa was more interested in hunting the Europeans' horses, which he believed to be a new kind of llama. He brought no weapons for battle or harnesses for defense, only knives and lassos for the purpose of hunting this new kind of llamas. Not concerned about the few people who had come, or interested in who they were, they brought only the knives for skinning and quartering the animals. Atahualpa agreed to meet with the Spanish, and sent an envoy of guides with instructions to lead them to a small town known as Cajamarca. This was one of the stops along Atahualpa's tour of the country, where he was already scheduled to conduct a ritual in which he presented ceremonial weapons to the local youths. Agreeing to meet the Spanish was a show of friendship, but it's clear that Atahualpa also wanted to give them a show of force. In the heart of his empire, faced with the full might of the Inca army, any aggression by these mysterious foreigners could be swiftly crushed. Atahualpa seems to have determined to make Pizarro his subject, and if that didn't work, he would kill him but things would not go according to his plan. Pizarro and his men traveled slowly along the Inca roads, passing inland through the desert forests of the Amotape hills and stopping every now and then at Inca towns and storehouses. They were supported by a team of enslaved men and women from Africa and Central America, and by some locals that they had either convinced or forced to follow them. Along the way, when Pizarro met with any resistance, 
He made a point of burning local chiefs alive, and he made an extensive use of this terror tactic throughout his campaign. Over the course of this journey, he burned dozens and maybe hundreds of men alive at the stake. On their journey, they saw the desert landscape watered by extensive irrigation systems, with crops and animals in abundance. As they climbed higher into the mountains, they marveled at the sophisticated bridges that crossed the tumultuous mountain rivers, many built of stone and some woven out of ichu grass. Francisco Jerez notes the fine roads leading up through the mountains. The road to Chincha passed through many villages and led from the river San Miguel. It was paved and bounded on each side by a wall. Two carts could be driven abreast upon it. From Chincha it led to Cusco, and in many parts of it, rows of trees were planted on either side for the sake of their shade on the road. As the Spaniards went, they learned more about the lands ahead, sometimes through torturing locals, other times from local lords who simply hated Atahualpa, who had been loyal to Huascar and wanted to see their new emperor fall. They found out that this king Atahualpa ruled from a city called Cusco, and that he held a vast army that could easily destroy them all. From one local lord, they heard about the recent civil war. They saw the bodies of recently executed men hanging by their feet at the entrance of one town, and heard that this was a punishment for backing the losing side in this war, as Francisco Jerez recounts. Until a year ago, all of those towns had been for the King of Cuzco, the son of the old King of Cuzco, until his brother, Atahualpa, rose up, and he has come conquering the land, taking great tributes and services, and every day he commits great cruelties on them. Despite all these warnings, Pizarro decided on a course of action. He would meet this Inca king and take him prisoner. In this plan of action, Pizarro was clearly imitating his cousin, Hernán Cortés, who had effectively kidnapped the Emperor Moctezuma and used him to take control of his empire. But Cortés hadn't invented this tactic, and it was actually extremely common among all the early colonists of the Americas. Pizarro himself had a long history of hostage-taking in Nicaragua and Panama, and it was common to capture local chiefs and force their tribes to pay a ransom to get them back. If this king Atahualpa was as rich as Pizarro had heard, then the ransom to be gathered from his capture would be truly enormous. The climb into the mountains was difficult. As the roads soared higher into the rocky passes, Pizarro's horsemen had to dismount and led their horses up narrow trails so steep that in some places they had been carved into stone staircases. Higher up, the snows were an unfamiliar challenge after so many months fighting through baking tropical heat, as Francisco Jerez records. The cold is so great on these mountains that some of the horses accustomed to the warmth of the valleys were frostbitten. At one point, some food and supplies arrived for the Spanish from Atahualpa, along with his wishes that they should come to meet him soon. Finally, after weeks of traveling, the Spanish found their way to the wide valley where the town of Cajamarca stood. The bowl of the valley was surrounded by green hills, and the valley bottom was marshy, fed by the waters of three rivers. When Pizarro and his men finally arrived at Cajamarca, they found the army of the Emperor Atahualpa encamped in the hills outside the town. 
numbering anywhere between 50 to 80,000 men. These were the crack troops of the Inca, battle-hardened from their campaigns in the Civil War. They must have looked with curiosity, but also a little derision at the ragtag group of Spanish soldiers, filthy from their weeks on the road, pink in the face and out of breath in the mountain air, many of them covered with boils and sores from tropical diseases. They must have looked like a sorry lot to the Grand Army of the Inca. Francisco Jerez recounts the tense atmosphere on Pizarro's arrival. The governor arrived at this town of Cajamarca on Friday the 15th of November 1532 at the hour of Vespers. In the middle of the town there was a great open space surrounded by walls and houses. The governor occupied this position and sent a messenger to Atahualpa to announce his arrival, to arrange a meeting that he might show him where to lodge. Meanwhile, he ordered the town to be examined with a view to discovering a stronger position where he might pitch the camp. The Emperor Atahualpa was still in seclusion as part of the ritual he was conducting, and he didn't hurry out to meet the Spanish. Pizarro approached from the northwest along the old imperial highway, and when they arrived he ordered his artillerymen to set up their cannons on the ceremonial plaza in the middle of the city, in full view of the encamped Inca army. The Inca soldiers must have looked on with curiosity, but they did nothing to stop them. That night, a storm came in over the hills, bringing rain and hail. The hailstones must have plinked and plonked on the helmets and armour of the Spanish, as they encamped among the temple stones, and gazed with narrowed eyes at the lights of the Inca camp, which must have stretched across the hills for a distance of miles, as Jerez recalls. All the men were on foot outside the tents with their arms, consisting of long lances like pikes, stuck into the ground. There seemed to be upwards of 30,000 men in the camp. In the morning, they rode out to meet Atahualpa. At first, he continued to play it cool and showed little interest in them. In fact, he acted bored by their presence. Then he complained that they had treated some of his people poorly on the coast, burning people alive and abusing the priestesses in the temples. He even produced an iron collar that had been brought to him and that he said the Spanish had forced one of his allies to wear. Pizarro denied all this and promised that all he wanted was to swear loyalty to Atahualpa and fight on his behalf. The Inca emperor soon let down his guard and began to warm to the idea of welcoming the Spanish as subjects. He suggested that they should go together and crush a local chief who was defying his rule, and Pizarro happily agreed, saying that all the job would take would be ten Spanish horsemen. Atahualpa found this funny. And to seal the deal, they drank maize beer together from golden cups that Pizarro must have noticed with some interest. Then they agreed to meet again in the Grand Plaza of Cajamarca the following day. Both men left the meeting satisfied. Atahualpa seems to have set his fears aside while Pizarro returned to his camp to hatch his plan for the following day. As the sun rose, still under cover of darkness, Pizarro and his men set their trap. He hid his cavalry inside the great halls that surrounded the plaza, while his artillery pieces were loaded and ready to fire on top of the ceremonial temple. And now all they had to do was wait. 
but Atahualpa, as usual, was in no hurry. Pizarro and his men waited and waited. And then finally, as the afternoon grew late, they heard the sound of the vast Inca army drawing near. Many of the Spanish soldiers were terrified. Their lookouts announced that Atahualpa had arrived at the head of his army. But Atahualpa, for his part, made a number of bad decisions. He had originally planned to enter the city with a troop of his well-armed soldiers. But his meeting with Pizarro the previous day seems to have set his mind completely at ease. At the last minute, he elected instead to march into Cajamarca with only his ceremonial troops and servants, most of which were unarmed. Jerez recalls the colorful scene that unfolded before the Spanish as the Inca king entered the courtyard, resplendent in full ceremonial dress. First came a squadron of Indians, dressed in a livery of different colors like a chessboard. They advanced, removing the straws from the ground and sweeping the road. Next came three squadrons in different dresses, dancing and singing. Then came a number of men with armor, large metal plates and crowns of gold and silver. Among them was Atahualpa, in a litter lined with plumes and macaws feathers of many colors and adorned with plates of gold and silver. The Inca army behind them was also not prepared for a battle and were instead arraigned for a ceremony. They were stretched out in a long column along the road approaching the city, which cut a narrow path over the marshy land, and many of them would not even have realized that something was wrong before it was too late. When Atahualpa and his ceremonial guard entered the plaza, Pizarro gave the order to attack. All at once, the Spanish unleashed hell. The cannons would have gone off with a terrifying crack, and cannonballs would have whizzed into the Inca lines, smashing bodies and bones to pulp as they went. Spanish arquebuses fired into the Inca procession, and then the cavalry hiding in the temples came charging out. The Spanish horses, guns and cannons were three weapons that the Inca had never even imagined, let alone encountered before. And the effect of being attacked with all three at once must have simply frozen them in their tracks. Francisco Jerez writes about the pandemonium that unfolded in the main square of Cajamarca. Then the guns were fired off. The trumpets were sounded and the troops, both horse and foot, sallied forth. On seeing the horses charge, many of the Indians who were in the open space fled, and such was the force with which they ran that they broke down part of the wall surrounding it, and many fell over each other. The horsemen rode them down, killing and wounding and following in pursuit. The infantry made so good an assault upon those that remained in such a short time, most of them were put to the sword. The Emperor Atahualpa's escort stampeded in a panic back towards the rest of their still advancing army, and the resulting collision of people saw many crushed underfoot. Francisco Jerez recalls the panic that overtook them. So great was the terror of the Indians at seeing the governor force his way through them, at hearing the fire of the artillery and beholding the charging of horses, a thing never before heard of, that they thought more of flying to save their lives than of fighting. The Spanish cavalry rode back and forth through the throngs of fleeing Inca and slaughtered as many as 7,000 of them over the following two hours as the sun set red over the city. The death toll amounted to something like 40 dead for each Spanish soldier. The Inca chronicler Taitu Kusi records the panic that spread through the Inca ranks. The Indians were thus penned up like sheep in this enclosed plaza, 
unable to move because there were so many of them. Also, they had no weapons, as they had not brought any, being so little concerned about the Spaniards. The Spaniards stormed with great fury to the center of the plaza where the Inca's seat was placed. Taitu Kusi recalls bitterly the slaughter of that day. Because the Indians uttered loud cries, they started killing them with the horses, the swords or guns like one kills sheep, without anyone being able to resist them. Of more than 10,000, not even 200 escaped. As darkness fell, Atahualpa himself was captured, and Pizarro ordered his men to fall back into the temple. There, the Inca emperor seethed, stunned and speechless. We can only imagine the shock and rage he must have felt to have fought for so long against his brother Huascar, to have the crown of the empire come so close to his grasp, to have sacrificed so much, only to have this bolt from the blue strike him down. He must have sat there in pure disbelief, trying to understand what had just happened. Francisco Jerez captures some of this in his account. The governor went to his lodgings with his prisoner at a whelper, despoiled of his robes, which the Spaniards had torn off in pulling him off the litter. The governor presently ordered native clothes to be brought, and when Atahualpa was dressed, he made him sit near him, and soothed his rage and agitation at finding himself so quickly fallen from his high estate. Pizarro, himself likely a little stunned at the speed and the totality of his victory, is recorded to have swelled with a number of incredible boasts. Among other things, the governor said to him, do not take it as an insult that you have been defeated and taken prisoner. For with the Christians who come with me, though so few in number, I have conquered greater kingdoms than yours, and have defeated other more powerful lords than you, imposing upon them the dominion of the emperor, whose vassal I am, and who is the king of Spain and of the universal world. We come to conquer this land by his command. What happened next has passed into legend. Francisco Jerez recounts the glorious promises that Atahualpa made. Atahualpa feared that the Spaniards would kill him, so he told the governor that he would give his captors a great quantity of gold and silver. The governor asked him, How much can you give, and in what time? Atahualpa said, I will give gold enough to fill a room 22 feet long and 17 wide, up to a white line which is halfway up the wall. The height would be that of a man's stature and a half. He said that up to that mark he would fill the room with different kinds of gold vessels, such as jars, pots, vases, besides lumps and other pieces. As for silver, he said he would fill the whole chamber with it twice over. He undertook to do this in two months. The governor told him to send off messengers with this object, and that when it was accomplished, he need have no fear. And Atahualpa made good on his promise. Over the next months, gold flooded into the town of Cajamarca from all over the empire until the room was filled with a glittering pile of ornaments and vases. They brought many vases, jars and pots of gold and much silver, and he said that more was on the road. Thus on some days, 20,000, on others 30,000, on others 50,000 or 60,000 pesos of gold arrived, in vases, great pots weighing two or three arobas, and other vessels. The governor ordered it all to be put in the house where Atahualpa had his guards, until he had accomplished what he had promised. This offer by Atahualpa is often portrayed as a desperate bid by a terrified man bargaining for his life. But given the hand he was dealt, 
Atahualpa was actually making a pretty calculated play. Atahualpa regaled the Spaniards with tales of the vast wealth of the Inca Empire, and especially emphasized the city of Cusco as the jewel in its crown. He urged them to march there and loot it. And here we can see that Atahualpa's shock was already transforming into a kind of cold calculation. In fact, he had himself been intending to march to Cusco and loot it. He conveniently neglected to mention his own city of Quito to the Spanish, where he had been intending to move his imperial court. He had quickly determined the Spaniards' weakness, that is, their obsession with gold above all else, and he would play on it in order to buy time and attempt to tip the scales back in his favor. He knew that filling a room with gold would take weeks and months, and would give him the time to dispose of his imprisoned brother and any other nobles who could still oppose him. Under the guise of sending out messengers to gather gold, he could get word out to all corners of his empire, and the Spanish didn't know that the rainy season was just beginning in the Andes. Even a short delay meant that they would soon face increased snowfall. The high mountain tundras would turn to impassable mud that would isolate them from their supply lines on the coast. In addition, the weight of the gold would stop them from moving quickly and potentially expose them to attack. Atahualpa's promise also ensured that they would stay in the relatively unimportant town of Cajamarca to wait for their gold, meaning that they couldn't march on to the more important centers of Cusco or Quito. And so Atahualpa's messengers came back and forth to him during his months of captivity. Only a few days after his capture, he heard some good news. News of the situation had reached the soldiers who were transporting his brother Huascar, and they had immediately executed their prisoner. Atahualpa was now the only remaining Inca prince with a strong claim to the throne, and he knew that the Spanish would need him to rule the empire on their behalf. In just a matter of days, he had actually turned this situation quite heavily in his favor. And the best part of the deal was, the gold that poured in every day to fill that room in Cajamarca didn't even belong to him. His treasury in the city of Quito remained untouched, while he directed the Spanish to exactly where to find the gold of his political rivals. They sent out riders to Cusco, and Atahualpa's soldiers showed them exactly where to loot the treasures from the fine houses of the nobles still loyal to his dead brother, and any who still challenged his claim. This was the work not of a desperate man, but of an incredibly shrewd political operator. When the rulers of the powerful city and shrine of Pachacamac came to meet Pizarro, Atahualpa saw an opportunity to rid himself of these powerful rivals. He told the Spanish that these men were thieves and liars, and that the shrine was incredibly wealthy. Pizarro obligingly put these lords in chains and sent out horsemen to strip their temples of their wealth. The Spanish were now a weapon that Atahualpa could aim at will with just a few words in the right ears. The problem for Atahualpa was that others would soon learn this lesson too. His great rivals the lords of Cusco would soon become more confident in speaking to Pizarro and his men, and they happily began to spread rumors among the Spanish. They passed on news that Atahualpa was planning to attack Pizarro, that an army of 200,000 of his frontier warriors were marching their way, along with a horde of 30,000 cannibals hungry for Spanish flesh. Fatally for the Inca king, this is one outlandish rumor that Pizarro seems to have believed. 
Regardless of its truth, Pizarro made a rash and impulsive decision, as Francisco Jerez recalls. When the governor, with the occurrence of the officers of his majesty and the captains and persons of experience, sentenced Atahualpa to death, his sentence was that, for the treason he had committed, he should die by burning, unless he became a Christian. They brought out Atahualpa to execution, and when he came into the square, he said he would become a Christian. The governor was informed and ordered him to be baptized. The governor then ordered that he should not be burned, but that he should be fastened to a pole in the open space and strangled. This was done, and the body was left until the morning of the next day. Such was the end of this man. He died with great fortitude and without showing any feeling. On the Inca side, the chronicler Taitu Kusi, a nephew of Atahualpa, relates these events briefly and with little color. The Spaniard positioned his spies everywhere and ordered highest alert. Without delay, he had my uncle Atahualpa brought out of prison into the open and, without any resistance, garroted him on a pole in the middle of the square. The Spanish never made any attempt to fortify the city against the supposed attack or to prepare themselves for battle. Pizarro sent out a scout to determine whether any army was headed their way, but no sign of it was ever found. The Spanish dug a grave for Atahualpa and left the last emperor of the Inca to the worms. After the death of Atahualpa, the Spanish installed the first of what would be many Inca puppet emperors, one of Atahualpa's brothers named Tupac Hualpa, but he died of European diseases in only a matter of months. Next, they crowned one of Atahualpa's brothers, a man named Manco Inca Yapanqui. He was the father of the chronicler Taitu Kusi, who we've heard a fair amount from already. He was a loyal puppet king to the Spanish for a while, but as soon as he saw his opening, he rebelled. He laid siege to the Spanish in Cusco and sent another army to attack the new capital of Lima too, resulting in the deaths of as many as 500 European settlers. He set up a rebel state in the remote jungles of Vilcabamba, where the Andes slope down into the Amazon rainforest. This was the last fortress of the free Inca, and they would hold out against the Spanish for a further 30 years. Pizarro's cousin Pedro recalls the audacity of this rebellion. Manco Inca took refuge in the Andes, which is a land of enormous rugged mountains with very bad passes and where it's impossible for horses to enter. And from there, he sent many high-ranking captains all over the realm in order to gather up all the natives who could fight and who could go with them to lay siege to Cusco and to kill all of us Spaniards who were there. As the years passed, countless puppet emperors would be installed to rule over the Andes, but none of them lasted for very long. Several were assassinated by their own people, who looked on them quite rightly as collaborators with the foreign invaders. Others escaped into the mountains and became rebel chiefs, raising armies against the Spanish or fleeing to the free Inca fortress of Vilcabamba. In fact, for at least the next 50 years, the Spanish fought a running series of guerrilla counterinsurgencies against the Inca, struggling to pacify a land that they had long since declared conquered. As the French monk and explorer Marcos de Niza recalls, It was only because of this maltreatment that the peoples of Peru were finally provoked into revolt and took up arms against the Spanish, as indeed they had every cause to do for the Spanish never treated them squarely, 
never honoured any of the undertakings they gave, but rather set about destroying the entire territory for no good reason and without any justification. And eventually the people decided that they would rather die fighting than put up any longer with what was being done to them. In the year 1616, the Quechuan nobleman, Philippe Guaman Poma de Ayala, authored a remarkable text known as the Letter to a King. In it, he recounts the abuses and injustices of the Spanish colonialists, and denounces the hardship exacted on his people. It amounts to one of the first full-throated denunciations of the colonial system ever written by one of its subjects. The Spaniards in Peru should be made to refrain from arrogance and brutality towards the Indians. Just imagine that our people were to arrive in Spain and start confiscating property, sleeping with the women and girls, chastising the men and treating everybody like pigs. What would the Spaniards do then? Even if they tried to endure their lot with resignation, they would still be liable to be arrested, tied to a pillar and flogged. And if they rebelled and attempted to kill their persecutors, they would certainly go to their death on the gallows. Francisco Pizarro had dreamed of one day surpassing his younger cousin Cortez in the glory of conquest, and by many measures he had. He had destroyed an empire ten times the size of the Aztec Empire, with about a third of the manpower, and he had done so at an enormous distance from the nearest friendly port in Panama. The writer Francisco Jerez put this achievement bluntly. When in ancient of modern times has so great an enterprise been undertaken by so few against so many odds, and to so varied a climate and seas, and at such great distances, conquer the unknown? The chronicler Cieza de Leon even places Pizarro on the pedestal of heroes like Alexander the Great. Many nations have excelled others and overcome. The few have conquered the many before. They say Alexander the Great, with 33,000 Macedonians, undertook to conquer the world. So with the Romans too. But no nation has with such resolution passed through such labors or such long periods of starvation, or covered such immense distances as the Spanish have done. In a period of 70 years, they have overcome and opened up a new world, greater than the one of which we had knowledge, exploring what was unknown and never before seen. But Pizarro's days of glory would be short-lived. In the 10 years that he ruled over Peru, he presided over the steady collapse and disintegration of the entire society that he had once heard such incredible stories about. Much of the local population was reduced to the level of serfs serving European lords. The Europeans systematically stripped the temples and palaces of the Inca, demolishing their cities stone by stone and reusing the material to build their own palaces and churches. Despite the destruction of their society and the repression that they suffered, the people of the Andes would continue to fight to keep their indigenous culture and the memory of their history alive. The writers of the enigmatic document known as the Warochiri Manuscript, writing at the end of the 16th century and under the direction of that Spanish priest who considered their old gods to be devils, wrote the following introduction to their book, which to this day stands as one of the greatest sources of information about the lives of these mountain people before the arrival of Europeans. If the ancestors of the people called Indians had known writing in earlier times, then the lives they lived would not have faded from view. As the mighty past of the Spanish is visible until now, so too would theirs be. But since things are as they are, and since nothing has been written until now, I set forth here the lives of the ancestors of the Warochiri people, 
who all descended from one forefather, what faith they held, how they lived from their dawning age onward, those things and more. Village by village, it will all be written down. A fifth of the gold that Pizarro had accumulated at Cajamarca was sent back to the Spanish crown. The rest Pizarro kept. He melted much of it down into ingots and divided it among his men. They were now richer than many of them had ever imagined possible. Some returned to Spain, while others stayed behind in Peru and established themselves as colonial lords. One chronicler wrote in ironic terms about the fate of one of these conquistadors who returned home, a man named Mancio Serra de la Guizamon, whose descent into gambling and vice was representative of the later lives of many of these soldiering adventurers. At the time the Spaniards first entered the city of Cusco, the gold image of the sun from its temple was taken in booty by a nobleman and conquistador by the name of Leguzamon, who I knew and was still alive when I came to Spain. He lost it in a night of gambling. Giving rise to the joke, he gambled the sun before the dawn. Greed and corruption also crippled the colony of Peru, now referred to by its new name of New Castile. As news of Pizarro's conquest spread, Spaniards from all across the colonial Americas began to flock to Peru. In 1534, a large fleet of 12 ships arrived that was led by a man named Pedro de Alvarado. He was a feared conquistador who had joined Cortes on his conquest of Mexico. As we saw in episode 9, he was the captain who had been left behind in Tenochtitlan and who had slaughtered the Mexica people as they celebrated their festival of Toshcatl. Since then, he had developed a reputation for his cruelty. He arrived in Peru with hundreds of Spanish men and women, along with a sizable number of slaves, artillery, crossbows, and war dogs. A full party of settlers prepared to colonize this new land. He was among the first to follow in Pizarro's footsteps, but he would be far from the last. Before long, these new arrivals came into conflict, and the colony was plunged into civil war. Soon, Pizarro was fighting one of his former captains over who would rule in Cusco. The reign of the conquistadors in Peru was not the enlightened rule of the glorious crusading Christian knights that they had imagined, but resembled something like rival mafias fighting over gangland territory. These wars further devastated the land and left what remained of the monumental works of the Inca in ruins. The free Inca in the rebel city of Vilcabamba soon learned to bridge the technological divide with the Spanish, and it took them only a couple of decades. As early as 1537, the king Manco Inca defeated the Spanish at Pilcosuni, and they came into possession of modern weapons, including arquebuses, artillery, and crossbows. Just one year later, Manco Inca was recorded to be skilled enough to ride a horse into battle. In the early 1540s, several Spanish refugees would teach Inca warriors how to use Spanish weapons. And by the 1560s, it was recorded that many Inca had developed considerable skill in using early firearms and riding horses. But it would not be enough. The last Inca ruler to lead the free city of Vilcabamba was a man named Tupac Amaru. On June the 24th of the year 1572, a Spanish army led by veteran conquistador Martin Artudo de Arbieto made a final advance on the Inca's remote jungle capital. The city finally fell to Spanish cannons, and the Inca king Tupac Amaru fled the city. 
He was finally caught by the Spanish in the year 1572 and marched back to Cusco to face a military trial with five of his generals. These generals were all hanged, while Tupac Amaru was sentenced to be beheaded. On the day of his execution, a scaffold was erected in front of the main cathedral in the central square of Cusco, all draped in black cloth. It's reported that between 10,000 to 15,000 people came out to watch, and the plaza was so densely crowded that the chief officer of the court had to ride his horse through the people to clear a path. Tupac Amaru was carried through the crowd with his arms tied behind his back. When he mounted the scaffold, accompanied by the Bishop of Cusco, the entire crowd let out a blood-curdling wail of mourning, as one eyewitness named Martin de Marua recalls. As the magnitude of Indians, who completely filled the square, saw that sad and lamentable spectacle, and knew that their Inca and Lord was about to die, they deafened the skies, making them reverberate with their cries and wailing, and their relatives, who were near, cried out with tears and sobs. Tupac Amaru reached out his hand. He gave a clap, at which all the people fell silent. This was a manifest sign of the obedience, fear and respect that the Indians had for their Incas and lords. With just a clap, they silenced the cries and tears coming from the heart that are so difficult to hide. Then, the Emperor of the Free Inca let out these final words. Pachacamac, witness how my enemy shed my blood. With him, the Inca line came to an end. Pizarro had wanted to be a conqueror like Julius Caesar, and in the manner of his death, he got his wish. He was in his late 60s in June of 1541, when a group of armed men loyal to one of his rivals burst into his palace with daggers and assassinated him, stabbing him multiple times. He managed to kill two of his attackers and wound a third before being stabbed in the throat and then falling to the floor, where his attackers flocked around him and struck him again and again. I wonder whether in those moments he thought about the Inca Emperor Atahualpa and the look in his eyes as he had been strangled against that pole in Cajamarca. And perhaps then he might have understood what that look meant. To have gained everything you had ever fought for, only to have it snatched away in the violent hands of another. In the early 1930s, the sculptor Ramsay MacDonald created three copies of a bronze statue depicting a European soldier with sword drawn, riding a horse, the visor of his swooping 15th century helmet cocked open. He originally intended to sell the statue to Mexico as a depiction of the conqueror Hernán Cortés, but the statue was rejected. Instead, MacDonald approached the Peruvian government and sold them the same statue, saying that it could just as easily depict Pizarro. The statue was erected in the Peruvian capital of Lima in 1934, and perhaps it's a fitting piece of irony that even in death, Pizarro found himself playing the eternal second place to his younger and more refined cousin. In 2003, facing a rising swell of popular hatred towards him and a growing sense of indigenous identity in Peru, Pizarro's statue was removed from its position beside the government palace and was placed in a more obscure spot in a nearby park, where it remains to this day. Since the 19th century, a mummified body found in the Cathedral of Cusco was claimed to be the body of Francisco Pizarro, and many people came to pay their respects. But more modern analysis 
has shown that the body belongs to someone else. As the Inca Empire fractured and collapsed, and its ruins were built over by the Spanish, only those rare places that the Europeans couldn't reach or didn't know about were preserved. One of these was the cloud outpost of Machu Picchu. In fact, the Spanish never even heard about its existence. Sometime in the 1530s, as the Inca Empire collapsed, the people who operated it as a royal retreat or a coca plantation stopped receiving supplies from the rest of the empire. They simply left it behind to crumble into the hillside. The thatched roofs of this mountainside town would have been the first to rot and fall in, with vines and plants taking root among the eaves, putting down roots and rotting away the roof beams. As the cloud rolled in over the hills day after day, mosses and lichen would have begun to grow over the walls, and the immaculate terraces would have been completely covered in a winding growth of weeds. Little by little, the town of Machu Picchu would have disappeared beneath the shade of the trees until nothing remained to show that it had been there at all. The site of Vilcabamba, the last fortress of the Inca, where they held out for more than 30 years against the Spanish, was also abandoned, and its location forgotten. Its walls crumbled, and silk cotton trees put their roots down between its stones. Today it's located in a place known as Espiritu Pampa, or the Plain of Ghosts. On July the 2nd, 1964, the flamboyant explorer and archaeologist Jean Savoy was the first to travel to these ruins and correctly identify it as the last Inca stronghold of Vilcabamba. Savoy writes movingly about the eerie scenes as he traversed this series of melancholy ruins crumbling beneath the green twilight of the forest. The Inca road we have been following comes to a halt. I have the men spread out. It is a half hour before we find the groups of buildings. The stonework is of better quality than what we have seen before. It is evident that the cut white limestone blocks had once fit snugly together, although many had now been broken by feeder vines that had wormed their way between the stones and pried them apart. One of the buildings, a rectangular construction with two doorways guards a green-lit temple. A high elevated bulwark of stone consisting of rooms with niches and fallen door lintels, inner courtyards, and enclosures. It must have been very impressive when the Incas lived here. A large sacred boulder rests beside one of the walls. It looks as if it may have fallen from the top of the platform wall. A magnificent strangler fig with a spreading crown some 100 feet above our heads locks one of the walls in a grip of gnarled roots. Some of the rocks are squeezed out of place by its vice-like grip. Rattan vines hang down from its upper branches, forming a screen through which we must cut our way. I want to end this episode by reading a piece of Inca poetry supposedly composed by that great Inca king, Pachacuti Inca Yapanqui, in the dawning age of their empire. It's a prayer to the creator god, Viracocha, asking him to protect and keep the people of the Andes safe. We can imagine that as their world began to fall apart, the people of the Andes must have whispered this prayer to themselves, over their children and their families, and over the towns and cities nestled in the narrow valleys of the mountains. As you listen, try to imagine what it would feel like to watch the great society of the Inca deteriorate around you, beneath the twin forces of plague and civil war. Imagine watching the greed of the nobles tear your land apart, while a foreign power with guns and horses arrives to dictate your fate and demolish your cities brick by brick. Imagine the sorrow you would feel 
watching the blooming terraces empty and fill with weeds, the thatched roofs falling in, the wind howling through the halls and the walls crumbling, as the cloud washed in, relentless and forgetful over the hills. Jin Sanyak Wirakocha Apu Kocha Itu Wirakocha Wal Pai Waina Wirakocha Tukapu Ahnupu Wirakocha Runa Yachiko Virakocha Where are you? Outside Inside Above this world in the clouds Below this world in the shades Hear me, answer me, take my words to your heart. For ages without end, let me live. Grasp me in your arms, hold me in your hands. Receive this offering wherever you are, my Lord Viracocha. In shining clothes, let man live well. Let woman live well. Let the peoples multiply. Live blessed and prosperous lives. Preserve what you have infused with life for ages without end. Hold it in your hand. Before you stand your servants and the poor to whom you have given life and put in their places, let them be happy and blessed with their children and descendants. Let them not fall into veiled dangers along the lonely road. Let them live many years without weakening or loss. Let them eat. Let them drink. Oh, my Lord, my Creator, let them increase so the people do not suffer and not suffering, believe in you. Let it not frost. Let it not hail. Preserve all things in peace. Thank you once again for listening to the Fall of Civilizations podcast. I'd like to thank my voice actors for this episode, Annie Kelly, Jamie Tanner, Gerald Condlin, Peter Walters, Lachlan Lucas, and Jimmy Lai. Special thanks go to Edith Kispe and her grandmother, Celia Kispe, for helping us hear the ancient poetry of King Pachacuti in its original Ayacuchano Quechua. Much of the music for this episode was composed and compiled by Pavlos Kapralos using authentic Andean instruments. If you enjoyed these traditional performances, they will be available to download for all Patreon subscribers. I love to hear your thoughts and responses on Twitter, so please come and tell me what you thought. You can follow me at Paul M. M. Cooper. And if you'd like updates about the podcast, announcements about new episodes, as well as images, maps, and reading suggestions, you can follow the podcast at Fall of Civ Pod with underscores separating the words. This podcast can only keep going with the support of our generous subscribers on Patreon. You keep me running, you help me cover my costs, and you help keep the podcast ad-free. You also let me dedicate more time to writing, researching, recording, and editing to get the episodes out to you faster and to bring as much life and detail to them as possible. I want to thank all my subscribers for making this happen. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider heading on to patreon.com forward slash fall of civilizations underscore podcast or just Google Fall of Civilizations Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. For now, all the best, and thanks for listening. <laughs>